The treatment of CRSWMP has until recently been fairly straightforward, with clinicians opting to perform surgery of the nose and paranasal sinuses. But advances in medicine now mean that physicians have far more treatment options available to them, and they now have to make a balanced judgment on the relative merits of each of them. They have to take into account the disease process, the pathophysiology, the presenting symptomatology, the pros and cons of each treatment, and of course, the wishes of the patient. There are real challenges in terms of the multitude of factors that have to be accounted for before an individualized treatment plan can be recommended. It is not plain sailing. Now, the question that remains utmost in people's minds is how can we use biologics and surgery to get the best outcomes for patients with CRSWMP? Well, over the next hour, we intend to get answers. Welcome to the Euphoria Innovation Forum debate. Hello, I'm Dr. David Bull, and welcome to this Euphoria Innovation Forum debate on CRSWMP. It is fantastic to have your company. Now, the management of patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps, or CRSWMP, has been, well, it's been transformed over the last few years. Thanks to pioneering work over the last two decades, we now know so much more about the disease, and our knowledge of the underlying pathology has also grown exponentially. We can now chart the course of the disease using biomarkers. We have a whole new class of drugs called biologics, which have transformed patient care. And we have far better understanding and awareness of comorbidities that may present. Now, for several years, biologics have been indicated and they are available in a growing number of countries for severe uncontrolled CRS WMP but sadly they are not available in all countries. And that means that surgery or even revision surgery remains the most widely used option in most countries around the world. This debate aims to explore the main therapeutic options available to clinicians and to address one main question. How can we use biologics and surgery to achieve the best outcomes for patients with CRS WNP? Well, to discuss this pressing topic, I am delighted to introduce our panelists. Firstly, our medical experts. From Amsterdam in the Netherlands, Professor Witske Fokkens. She is Professor of Otorhinolaryngology at the Academic Medical Center. She is also Secretary General of the European Rhinological Society and Chair of the European Position Paper on Rhinosinusitis and Nasal Polyps, or EPOS. From Munich in Germany, Dr. Adam Scharker. He is a specialist in ENT, allergy and the environment at the Klinikum Rex de Isar at the Technical University of Munich. From Norfolk, Virginia in the United States, Professor Joseph Hahn. He is chief of the Division of Rhinology and Endoscopic Sinus and Skull Base Surgery at Eastern Virginia Medical School. From Barcelona in Spain, Professor Joachim Mullol. He is director of the Rhinology Unit and Smell Clinic in the ENT department at the Hospital Clinic. He is also coordinator of the multidisciplinary team, Clinical and Experimental Immunoallergy at Idibaps in Barcelona. And joining them are two representatives of the Patient Advisory Board of Euphoria, both from Belgium. They are Natasha Seams and also Daisy Weinberg. A very warm welcome to all of you. Now, we're going to divide our debate into three sections. The first section will be about key considerations for the indication of both revision surgery and biologics, which have revolutionized treatment for patients with CRSWMP, as well as looking at patients' perspectives of each of these therapies. The second section will address the multitude of different factors that healthcare providers can and should discuss with their patients as they determine which therapy or indeed combination of therapies can pose the greatest benefits to patients. And finally, the third section will look at the challenges and the uncertainties in relation to each of these options.
So let's start our debate looking at the key considerations for the various treatment options. Let me start uh, with you, if I can, Dr. Sharka. If you could, uh, for everyone's benefit, talk us through CRSWMP. Tell us the incidence, the symptomatology, and indeed how it presents. It's probably a largely underestimated and somehow heterogeneous disease. So according to autopsy studies, we would estimate around about 4% of an average uh, population to suffer from CRSWNP, but not everyone will report strong symptoms um, that will uh, be present on an everyday basis. The symptomatology that uh, differentiates chronic rhinosinusitis per se with an incidence of around about 10% in the European population is that uh, mainly serious WNP impacts on the sense of smell, which is a bit different, but it also impacts on sleep, on um, concentration and daily, let's say, um, focus in, in your daily work. It uh, further affects um, not only the sense of smell, but also the ability to breathe, patients will suffer from a blocked nose. And then you have different subtypes, some of which will present with a little bit more, let's like, say, recurrent exacerbations and infections, and others will have other nasal symptoms like um, um, uh, nasal, um, um, posterior nasal drip, or a runny nose, or hyperactivity. I think what is also very important to mention is that it's very common that the more severe this disease gets, the more it is associated to comorbidities, and this is depending on the mechanism. Um, the mechanism resembles a little bit of allergic inflammation, but it's not necessary to have allergic sensitization. And these patients often present with comorbid asthma and other type 2 disease. Well, thank you very much indeed. That leads me really nicely, actually, to, to you, Professor Fockens. Now, we know the underlying mechanism is type 2 inflammation. We just heard about certain comorbidities that may exist. Would you like to expand on that? Well, very important that um, many of the severe patients, and we talk about at least 60, 70, 80 percent of the patients with chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps, have asthma and very often they have late onset severe asthma which results in declining lung function and eventually in, in very severe low airway disease. So it's extremely important to recognize uh, that that is not a simple allergic asthma that is uh, benign but can be very uh, uh, severe and life-threatening and that that is the uh, combination that we very often see with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. Well, that's really fascinating. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Fockins. Now, that leads me really nicely, actually, into to patients. Let's, let's come to you, if I can, Daisy, Daisy Weyenberg. If you can remember back, tell us about your symptoms, how you presented, and, and what happened next, what treatment you got. Uh, well, I've got uh, 10 years ago, I've got two uh, surgeries in six months and afterwards it's going uh, very well for a while, but then uh, um, the process re repeats itself with a lot of pain, a lot of medication um, and then we restarted a uh, few treatments with uh, different types of medication. Uh, until we, we found the uh, biologics. And when I found that, um, the improvement came suddenly. Uh, now the, the treatment is uh, stable, but sometimes it, it happened that uh, there is some up or down. Mm. And Daisy, just, just let's think back to before when you had the surgery. What were your symptoms? What did you present with? Um, I had a lot of symptoms. I had uh, pain all over my face. I couldn't uh, breathe. There wasn't enough uh, space in my nose, so, so I couldn't breathe uh, well. Um, I didn't smell and I didn't taste anymore. So there was uh, the whole 
13. Fantastic. Let, let me now bring in Natasha, if I can. Let's just talk about your symptoms. How did you present? What symptoms did you have? Um, for me, it all started with a, like a, a normal cold, which got worse and worse and worse. And then um, the family doctor um, told me to go to a specialist. And um, the specialist saw a lot of um, polyps in my nose. And that's when I got my first surgery. Um, then um, it didn't go any better, so I had to have a second and a third surgery. And um, but as a patient, I find it very hard um, because you don't know if the first surgeon has done a good job or a bad job, hmm. and maybe did did something wrong the first one and something went wrong i don't know but at first the problems even got worse for me and, and then after your surgery you went on to biologics as well did you yeah but also a lot of different ones um next week i will be having my fourth different uh, bi uh, biologics right Medic so so yeah. can i bring in professor malol at this point i mean I think really just listening to both of their stories, there are a number of treatment options here, aren't there? What did you make of, of those two stories? Is, is that an, a normal occurrence that people start with surgery, they then tend to get biologics, you might have to change the biologics, people respond differently? Well, actually the, the natural history of the disease usually starts uh, many times uh, such as rhinitis, symptoms in the nose that sometimes are confused with allergic rhinitis and so, and so on. And this is, is evolving in the time. Uh, uh, some treatment are started if the day correct diagnosis has been done. Sometimes the correct diagnostic is not done until several years. And uh, intranasal corticosteroids, short courses of oral steroids, nasal lavages, and so on, are the main treatments at the beginning. Mm. If, the, if the disease becomes uncontrolled, that is what we are talking about, is when uh, surgery uh, becomes the first option to clean up all the, the inflammation that there is in the nose and the, and the sinuses. And uh, when even surgery is not enough, uh, before we had not other possibilities. Uh, we should go from medical treatment to surgery, to medical treatment, to surgery again, and so on. But now we have a, a, a new a, a option of treatment that are the use of biologicals that uh, are uh, uh, added to the, 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 the previous surgery, uh, a very effective a way to treat these patients, or most of these patients. Mm. This is a really good place to bring you in, Joseph, Professor Han. You're in the United States. Is there a, a gold standard in terms of therapy? Is there an algorithm? Is there a recipe that should always be followed? I mean, we're hearing those stories. Do you always start with surgery? Do you add in biologics later? What, what do you do in the States? Yeah, I'm not sure if there is a gold standard, but there is a certain algorithm that most experts who treat nasal polyps, whether in the U.S. or outside the U.S., would kind of agree on. Most people would say that they should undergo um, some medical treatment. Uh, it may be a short burst of steroids, and uh, our, I think our main treatment option is topical steroids. And if the patients fail after this treatment, then most patients should do surgery. Now, how complete the surgery is and how much surgery is done, I think, is kind of dependent. But most people say, depending on the severity of the nasal polyp, if it's really severe, you should open up all the sinus cavities. Once that's done and then, then the polyps come back, then that's where I think there is some divergence and there are treatment options I think we have in the U.S. that may not be available outside the U.S. So we have things like steroid stents or implants that we can put in. Uh, we have different ways of delivering topical steroids. Um, we could use that before 
or even after surgery. And certainly we have biologics. And uh, we're very fortunate to have three biologics. Um, as you heard, um, Daisy and Natasha have. I mean, and you even hear Natasha saying even that she's even going to her fourth one. So there are different biologics that are available and we have more uh, biologics that are being studied. Uh, and can I bring you in again, Professor Falkins, just in terms of this, uh, is it really up to the clinician then? We just heard from Joseph, but in terms of using biologics, do we start with, with medicines? Do we then move to surgery? Do you start uh, with steroids? Is it a judgment call? Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Bull. I don't think so. I think most international guidelines advise to use, as uh, Joe already said, intranasal steroids first with rinsing, then try systemic corticosteroids, then try surgery. And if all that fails and the patient has type 2 disease, a severe impact on quality of life, uh, loss of smell, and uh, very often asthma, in those patients, we can decide to go for a biologic. Right. So it's not really up to uh, the clinician, but of course, sometimes uh, patients in, uh, in, in, in the discussion with the um, ENT surgeon decide that they rather want to have another surgery instead of biologics, for example, or vice versa. So it's, um, a shared decision with the patient, but the guidelines are quite clear. Okay, Dr. Shankar, what are your thoughts on that? The guidelines are clear, would you agree? Um, I think we have very good guidelines. Most of them are based on a very long experience, uh, however, from the pre-biologic era. Um, the availability of information for the patients um, has uh, led together with new opportunities in therapy that we have, um, let's say, much more engaged discussions with our patients uh, in the sense of um, shared decision making, as Professor Fockens just has mentioned earlier. Um, I, think, I think the guidelines are, however, a very important um, a map uh, that can orientate you, not only as the treating physician or surgeon, but also as we have lay summaries and patient information available. Thank you also to Euphoria. Um, that patients actually can say, okay, this is my problem and this is what, what I want to achieve, where I want to go. And if you take the time, it's not so much time actually, to um, define together your therapeutic goals, what is realistic, what are the given um, evidences, is it type 2 disease, have we, have we um, understood what is the pinnacle of the disease, in a, in a way, I mean, we are still limited there, mm. for sure, then, then we can go on and make a more mature treatment decision. And as, as Professor Fockens has already said earlier, there are patients who would prefer surgery and there are other patients who would prefer a biological treatment and there are three that are licensed currently in Europe and the US and um, I think when we look at the studies and also at the real world evidence we see that the error bars are quite large between treatments so it is not that we can really predict what is going to work perfectly but we can advise a little bit more and that's I think the new era since four years available, first biologics um, uh, can be prescribed in label in our indication. And that has changed something. And it did not only change the, let's say, modalities that are available, the options, but it has changed as well that we can be much more ambitious with uh, defining our therapeutic goals, in particular for those patients who suffer most. Mm. And Professor Mullol, just in terms of geography, there are certain countries where you, you simply don't have the biologics or indeed the choice of biologics. So Joseph made the point that in the US they have a treatment options that are available to them that we may not have in Europe and certainly not here in the United Kingdom. Yes, you, you are totally right. And actually, uh, recently, last week, one of these uh, biologics was uh, approved for reimbursement in Spain. Probably we'll have the second one in a few months, but we have not had the reimbursement. 
that comes from from the origin that uh, although it is, they are usually very good and very uh, uh, potent drugs against inflammation that is the main cause of the disease the cost is is quite high and it's the, the she, although it's approved by the EMEA, by the FDA uh, it's each country the ministry of health who decide uh, mainly when the 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 system, the health system is socialized, like it's in Spain, probably, and probably in the UK, uh, who pays, who, who, who's going to pay the bill. <laughs> and uh, the costs are very high, the treatment of these drugs are very high, and uh, the, usually the demand of biologicals is not only in the area of rhinology, it comes from everywhere, from cancer, from uh, rheumatology, from asthma, from GPA, or whatever. And the number of patients that are being treated with uh, one of these biologicals, sometimes even with two, uh, is very high. And the cost for the social security systems is very high. And, and that is a problem. We have noticed that. We have tried to treat our patients through severe asthma because we had the indication uh, in the same patients. But we had a lot of obstacles, a lot of, of, of stops saying, uh, although these patients would deserve to be treated with biologic, you cannot treat it because it's not going to be reimbursed and the patient should pay by themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is a very problem in a number of countries. Let me just bring in the patients, actually. Natasha, what, what do you think about that? I don't know if you're aware that the treatment options differ depending on which country you're in. And in some countries, as we just heard, you have to pay because it's simply not available. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I do know that um, the medication is very expensive. Um, so, and I do also know that I'm very lucky um, that here in Belgium they pay it back. But on the other hand, um, to get the medication that I will be receiving in a few weeks, I had to take steroids for a, a year. So, which I also know that is very bad for my health. So. Yeah. It's not that you get it uh, in a very simple way. Right. And what about, what, sorry, just moving on to Daisy then. Daisy, what are your thoughts there that different countries have different treatment options? Were you aware of all of this? And, and, and just in terms of the, the differing treatment options that are available to you, and you're also in Belgium. Yes, I knew that uh, there were different options in different countries um, and I'm very glad that in Belgium there is a, a repayment for the medication but not from all of them so here in Belgium there are still some uh, types of medication that you have to pay by yourself but uh, for me there is no other option when I when I need a product I will, I will get it and I will pay for it because I know that it will help me. Mm. Okay, let me just pause you all there. Super, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's now move on to talk about the multiplicity of factors to take into account when looking at the different treatment options. <laughs> 